we are happy to have uh, Sergey Shadran who will talk about the non-commutative M0, M plus <laughs> one. Okay, good. Um, so, thank you. Uh, if you want to say something more or? Um, I, I, want to, I, I forgot what I wanted to say. So <laughs> wait up, yeah. Okay, good. So, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm indeed going to talk about um, some proposal for what should be a non-commutative M0 1 plus N, but, uh, uh, well, I feel that to this end, I have also to explain what is M0 1 plus N and why this space is absolutely remarkable in many ways, and, okay, at least what are the properties that we want to mimic in a non-commutative way. Uh, yeah, so non-commutative has appeared to be a complicated word, so I made exactly one typo in this word in uh, my title, absolutely, but exactly in the title, so I'm sorry for that. So, what Misha distributed was was uh, misspelled. In any case, so what I'm going to tell uh, today is a small fraction of my joint work with uh, Valodya Tsenka and Bruno Valet. And, uh, yeah, okay, so, well, it's more like, I don't know, I will explain uh, uh, just a small bit of that to uh, advertise this space that we call non-commutative M01 plus N. And uh, yeah, hopefully to ask you one important question about it. So, okay, so let's start. Uh, and so first I want to, ex uh, to explain what is so M01 plus N bar. So M01 plus N bar is a space that parameterizes the isomorphism classes. So that's what is written here in blue of possibly nodal rational curves with one plus n marked points. So one plus n, I'm, uh, well, uh, so specifying it, so, uh, so not for nothing, but I really want to distinguish one point. So I'm, I'm, I'm having this one point, so x zero, which I want to treat a bit differently, always. And here are two pictures to sort of give you an example of what is a nodal curve. Nodal curve is essentially just a tree of CP1s, uh, uh, with uh, marked points, so these marked points cannot coincide with nodes, so it should be smooth marked points. So they are ordered from zero to n, and I uh, uh, want to have only such curves that have no automorphisms. So it means that each each irreducible component must have at least three special points, so either nodes or or marked points, right? So for instance, I could not put on this component less points that we see there. So one node and so two mark points, right? But I always can add more points, right? So for instance, if I want to have eight points in this case, so I would add eight points, for instance, I can add here, so X8, right? But then, okay, so to have the, the same on this picture, so I would add X8 somewhere here, right? And of course, I mean, the typical example is when I just have a smooth curve. So if I would draw it algebraically, I would just draw it like that. So X0 and up to, so Xn. And if I would draw it topologically, it would be just a sphere with marked points, right? Okay, so what to say about the space? Um, yeah, examples. So M03, I just have three points. I consider the curves up to isomorphism. So I can put these three points at uh, the position zero, one, and infinity. So my uh, space that parameterizes such curves is just point. So this point is the isomorphism class of the curve so CP1, and so X0, X1, X2, and so there is no moduli in this case. Okay, so what is M04? So M04, okay, I have to add fourth point. And okay, so if I add fourth point, so then of course, I mean, I can add it in such a way that I still have a smooth curve. And that would be, so CP1 without three special points, the positions of X0, X1, and X2. But also I still have to compactify it use nodal curves. And there are three nodal curves that I have to add to complete it and to get CP1. So these are the nodal curves that uh, consist of two components. So there is one node and each company has two marked points. And so it's only important how I distribute the labels, right? So then I have three options and these three options are exactly these three special points that I need to add to complete the open M04. And in general, so if I would think further about that, so uh, this M01 plus N has a natural stratification. And I want to discuss this stratification. So it's parameterized by the so-called dual, uh, so dual graphs. So let me go to the next slide. 
So how to think about dual graphs? So you see, I want to, well, still think about uh, a nodal curve, but I want to encode its topological type. What I mean by topological type, it's irreducible component can have some modulus, right? So some complex structure that depends on the positions of the points. And uh, uh, so I want to ignore this complex structure and still to encode the topological type. And so to each irreducible component, I assign a vertex in some graph that I will call dual graph, or in this case, because I'm only talking about genus zero, it will, it will be a dual tree. So maybe graphs, maybe better to say trees. And uh, so then what I want, so I heard some, ah, okay, so no, it's, it's not, uh, I thought I heard some question, but okay. So uh, to each irreducible component, I want to assign a vertex. So for instance, okay, so I have here this irreducible component and uh, in the picture, it's this vertex. So to each node, I want to assign an edge. So for instance, okay, so let's look. So this is a node that connects to components and this is exactly this edge here. Right? To each marked, uh, oh, not to each marked point. So to the marked point X0, which I said is going to play a special role in my story because I want to distinguish it from the rest of the marked points, I assign the root of my graph. So this is a kind of a leg that goes down. And so if I will imagine a actual tree, I can plant it. So like that, right? So, and uh, so each marked point, uh, which is not X0, I assign a leaf uh, marked exactly by the label of this point. So for instance, okay, so I have here this X1. So this is a leaf attached exactly to the vertex that represents, that represents so this connected component, uh, this irreducible component, I'm sorry, right? So what we see, so what the, by the way, so what is the stability condition means? So stability condition, uh, by stability condition, I call the condition that this curve has no automorphisms, right? It just means that when I look at each vertex in this dual graph, there should be at least two, uh, uh, well, edges coming from above, right? So it should be at least a binary tree, right? Well, so each vertex should be at least, uh, well, I don't know how to call it properly, but should have at least two descendants in some, in some way. Okay, and so then the point is that, okay, so when I see all these graphs, so each graph uh, uh, actually gives me a topological type of a nodal curve, and what I have to do to consider the stratification of the model space of curves is just to list all the dual graphs, and for each dual graph to consider all possible curves uh, with uh, this dual graph, right? So here are examples. Again, so when I'm talking about, uh, when I'm talking about M03, well, I have nothing, as I said, but I mean, so I still have this point and this point represents my curve, which is in this case, a smooth curve. So this is this uh, dual graph, right? In the case of M04, well, first of all, I of course have smooth curves and smooth curves, they're always reducible. They always have one vertex and this one vertex has one attached root and three attached leaves corresponding to the marked points, right? And then I already told you that there are three special points and these three special points, they correspond to three possible dual graphs in this case that have two vertices, right? And one edge means that the corresponding curve has one node. Okay, so I also made here uh, an attempt to uh, sketch what happens in the case of M05. Well, it's a two dimensional complex manifold. And of course, so its main component still consists of just smooth curves. So I have just one just one uh, component and there are all five points, including the X zero on this component. But then I have, uh, so one dimensional uh, strata, which, uh, well, there are four strata of this type, means I have, so uh, in, in both cases, I have a two component curve. And so the difference between these two graphs is only how many extra marked points I have on the component with X zero. So this is my zero, right? So this is my root. And in this case, I have on that component only one extra marked point, and there are four ways to choose it. So I have four strata like that. And here I have on the component with X zero, I have two more marked points. And so there are six ways to choose this, right? So when I'm writing here times four and times six, I just mean that, there are, I mean, these, these uh, trees are not decorated by numbers, but there are that many ways to decorate them by numbers. And of course, I mean, still we have, I mean, the zero dimensional strata in M05 bar, so it means that it's actually always the zero dimensional strata are given by binary trees. 
And uh, so in this case, there are two types of binary trees and there are uh, so 12 ways to put the markings on this binary tree and three ways to put markings on this binary tree, right? So, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, when I consider dual graph, but I already said that maybe it's better to call it three. So uh, in this talk, but I don't know, I mean, I'll, I, I don't know, I mean, it doesn't matter. So I always can consider, so this M gamma, M gamma bar, in fact, is the closure of the stratum of all curves of type gamma, right? And so the question is, so what, what I have there, right? So because uh, if I have M gamma bar, it's interesting to ask, so what are the other strata that are in the compactification? And the uh, thing is that, okay, so uh, what I have there is the union of strata of smaller dimension, of course, so gamma accent, M gamma accent. And uh, 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 so I see a particular graph in the compactification of M gamma only if gamma can be obtained from that graph by contracting of some edges, right? So, uh, no, for instance, I mean, when I think about M0, one plus N, the full space, right? So I start with this graph, right? And so this graph can be obtained from any other graph by contracting of all of its edges, right? It means that when I want to consider the compactification of, of uh, uh, so the open part of uh, my model space, I get actually all graphs uh, there in compactification, right? So this, this, this statement. Okay. But uh, the most interesting thing that I want to discuss today, actually, so it's the most interesting because it allows me to, uh, well, inductively uh, discuss all the strata is the divisors, right? And so what I mean by divisors, so I just take graphs with one edge, by the way, so the number of edges is the co-dimension, is the co-dimension. And uh, 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 so when I think about uh, these particular curves, so what, what, what should it be? So I is, uh, I label all these divisors by the set I, where I is a subset of set uh, of all my labels from one to N. And it should, its cardinality should be at least two. So, and I consider so this graph where the uh, uh, labels of the of the uh, leaves on the second component on the second vertex are exactly i, right? So it means that in practice I consider the two component curves, where on one I have x zero, and then all labels from well I would denote it by n set minus i, and here I have all labels from i, right? So this kind of graphs, if I would, uh, this kind of curves, if I would draw them algebraically, and this is the node, right? And then of course I want to compactify it. And when I compactify it, I actually get that, okay, so both components I have to compactify as the corresponding model spaces. So I get a product of a uh, Cartesian product actually of two model spaces of small dimension. So these divisors are, uh, uh, well, really a very nice thing because uh, uh, so, well, they compactify the open model space and it's a normal crossing divisor in, in the sense that they all intersect transversely. So they all are reducible divisors for different eyes. They intersect each other transversely and each stratum that I had before, well, a closed stratum now I mean, right? So that I consider a stratum with its closure is uh, just equal to a transversal intersection of several divisors where, well, the number of divisors is equal to its co-dimension. On the level of dual graphs, I just have to look at each edge and each edge tells me which divisor I have to take for this particular edge, right? And a remarkable thing, well, it's uh, known for all the almost 30 years, is uh, that the cohomology of uh, M0, one plus N bar, so can be represented just as a algebra generated by these divisors. So it's only even cohomology. Uh, uh, model of the following two relations. So one relation is very important in mathematical physics. So this is the linear relation for the divisors. And uh, so by the way, we know that we should expect linear relations for the divisors because we had this example, let me go back for a second. We had this example of M04 and okay, so each divisor was just a point. And of course, all points are equal to each other in the cohomology, right? So we know that we should expect linear relations between the divisors. So in any case, so this is the full description of the uh, uh, linear relations between the divisors that we have in the cohomology. And uh, so there is also a quadratic relation, namely, we look at the products of the divisors. And if these two divisors physically don't intersect each other, which is basically the condition that is written here, right? 
physically do not intersect each other. So then the product is declared to be zero in cohomology. So which is also a very natural condition, right? Okay, so that's the description. And uh, uh, let me go ahead, so one step. Uh, yeah, so when I said that, so it's a full description, right? But it doesn't help you to intersect a divisor with itself, right? So what we know now, we know that if we take two different divisors, we can check this condition, we can check this condition, and then we know that either they intersect transversely and give a stratum that would be represented by a graph with two edges, or they don't intersect at all, and then we have zero. But how to intersect a divisor with itself? Yeah, so that's my next slide. That's my next slide. So namely, we have to introduce an extra tool. So the so-called Psi classes. So Psi classes are also some natural cohomology classes. Namely, so I consider my model space M01 plus N. So a point there is represented by an isomorphism class of a curve, of rational curve with N plus one mark points. And I can consider a cotangent line to this curve so evaluated at the ith marked point. So when I vary my isomorphism class of a curve, this cotangent line varies as a fiber of a line bundle that I call Li. And so what I want to have as Psi classes, so that's a definition. So I can write here definition. So uh, Psi i is just the first chain class of Li. Okay, so now two things, two things to say about these Psi classes. And uh, uh, I think I will be done with the first attempt to uh, describe some properties of M01 plus N bar. So namely, uh, one thing is, so I promise that it's going to help to intersect a divisor with itself. So I have my divisor DI. DI, as we already discussed, is actually, so this M gamma for gamma given by this graph where all uh, um, leaves with uh, label I are on the second at the second vertex, right? On the second company. So this is isomorphic to the product of two moduli spaces. Well, and uh, so you see, I have here. So how many points uh, I should? I have here one point for the root. So this one. Then I have n minus uh, cardinality of I points are exactly these marked points. But then if I want still to parameterize this uh, rational component, I also need extra marked point for the node. Right, so this one. And the same is here. So here is this output. So the root for this guy is also the node. And then I have still I marked points, right? So I have this product of model spaces and I have an initial map, sigma, or maybe it would be better to call it sigma uh, gamma. Well, gamma where gamma is exactly this graph. Well, which maps it to the model space of curves, right? So it's a sort of its image is exactly the divisor. So it's a, a map that realizes me, my divisor inside the model space of curves. And then the point is that I can express d squared of my divisor as a push forward with respect to this map over the following thing. So I just take, I just take my product of model spaces and I consider minus psi accent, so a minus psi two accent. So I mean, I take psi classes at the node on each branch with the sign minus and there, well, sum, I mean, is exactly what I have to push forward to the model space of curves to get the class of uh, D squared. And of course, I mean, I already told you that uh, the cohomology is fully described by the divisors, right? And um, so then it means that when I think about Psi classes, Psi classes should also be, well, it should be possible to describe them as linear combinations of divisors, right? And I give here, so this description, namely first I describe Psi zero. So I just say that Psi zero can be described as a sum of divisors di, where the condition that this i contains i and j, two selected indices, and that's true for any two selected indices. So equivalence can be established by looking at the relations between the divisors, linear relations. And then I also write what is psi zero plus psi i. So psi zero plus psi i is just the sum of divisors where the point i lies on a different company than the point zero, that is. Right, so that describes me fully what are the Psi classes in, uh, inside, so let me go back for a second, inside, so this description of the cohomology, right? Good. Okay, so uh, for a moment, I am done with the properties of the model space of the classical model space, well, commutative model space of curves of uh, general zero with uh, one plus n mark points. And now I'm going to show you 
another space that, well, so very precisely, but non-commutatively mimics all the properties I mentioned so far. But it's just a very, very small portion of the properties that I could actually present here. It's just that I want to show you now the main space that I want to talk about, and then maybe get back to some properties of M0, 1 plus N, and to mimic them again inside this different space. So I want to talk about these so-called brick manifolds. So brick manifolds, uh, well, there are many different ways how to define them and so on, so, but uh, I don't know. So we took for us as a sort of so main source, the paper of uh, Laura Escobar about uh, these manifolds. But yeah, I don't know. So uh, they are kind of, depends on your background. I can say that there are this, uh, how it's called, wonderful models uh, of uh, the Cancini Procesio for particular, uh, for particular hyperplane arrangements, the toric varieties of uh, Lade's realization of Asahedra as integral polytope. They are, uh, what else, a kind of both Summerson varieties. So, I mean, depends on, uh, what is your favorite way how to describe varieties? There are many ways how to describe them. Uh, so I'll describe them very naively as uh, actually as brick manifolds in, in uh, uh, the paper of Escobar. Namely, so let me start with a few examples. So you see, I'm going to put here some bricks one onto another. And so when one brick is over another brick, it means that I want the vector space that stays there contain that space as a, as a, as a subspace. And also there are all these bricks are arranged in levels and I want, uh, so the vector spaces that I put in these bricks to have dimension, well, at the lowest level one and the next level two and so on. Okay, so then there is one more uh, demand, namely, so when I put all these bricks, so I want to fix what happens at the sort of external bricks on each side, right? They should be absolutely standard. So, uh, for instance, so here there is no choice because if I would fix this one and this one, these two bricks, then they're all defixed. And I want to fix them to be just generated by some, well, I, I always have some distinguished uh, basis vectors. And uh, so it's just so E1 in both bricks, right? So now I'm thinking about B3 and what, what I want from B3. B3 is going to be the following. So here I have E1, here E1 and 2, here also E1 and 2. And so then I get down to E2. And then the only thing that I can choose here is this space, which I call V12, to stress that it's a sub, sub, uh, subspace of uh, the space E1 and E2. And it should be of dimension one. So clearly it's just, I mean, so the, the, the uh, choices of a vector space of dimension one inside a fixed two-dimensional vector space is just CP1, right? Sorry, Suresh. Uh, uh, do you require general position? Do you require that? You, I, I, you, I don't require anything. I only require this property, which is in green, in box. So V12 can coincide with E1, right? Uh, V12 can coincide with E1, and V12 can coincide with E2. Okay. And uh, uh, that's basically how I'm going to mimic this certification properties of the model space of curves in a few in a few minutes, not seconds, but minutes. Good. Uh, so what is before? So let me also explain before. So before, again, I start very standardly. So I have here E1. So then I add one more vector. So I have E1 and 2. Then I add one more vector. So E1 and 2, E3. So here I just repeat it at the highest level. And then I start to remove one by one. So the vectors from the left. So here I have E2, E3. Here I have E3, right? And now I have a choice. Now I have a choice. So this guy is a one dimensional subspace in E1, E2. So this guy is a one dimensional subspace in E2, E3. And this guy is a two dimensional subspace in E1, E2, E3, right? But it must contain these two. So if I have chosen these two in general position, I have no choice for this guy, right? For, uh, for V1C. But if, for instance, this guy is equal to E2, then, and this guy is equal to E2, then I still have a choice, right? So we see that, uh, well, it's always possible to construct this kind of varieties by a sequence of blow-ups, well, applied to, to uh, well, some standard configuration of the uh, N minus two dimensional torus. So let me now give it General description. So general description, Kuiver Grassmannian. It's a Kuiver Grassmannian for this type of Kuiver, right? So that is here. So again, I mean, now I'm, uh, instead of bricks, thinking in terms of Kuivers. So if I have an arrow from space below to the space above, 
and it's always an arrow from a space below to the space above. I just mean that this space is contained in the space above, so W V. And again, I want to have dimensions uh, for each level, uh, some fixed dimensions. So one, two, three, and so on up to N minus one. So here on the sides, I want to have fixed vector spaces. So I increase dimension by one, adding, uh, on the left, I increase dimension by one, adding an extra basis vector each time. Uh, uh, and then on the right, I uh, so decrease that when I go down, I decrease dimension by one by removing from the left one basis vector each time, right? And then what happens inside? Inside can happen everything, right? So again, uh, of course, I mean what we see is that if I if I would fix, I mean these basis vector spaces that I have one dimensional vector spaces below, if I put them in general position, then the rest is determined uniquely, right? But if I don't put them in general position, then maybe at some point I'll have to make some extra choices. So that's a space. And now let's look, let's look at certification of the space, right? Yeah, so, so that's what I just said. So if I look at this small piece of my graph, right? So I have these two spaces and I have a space that must contain all of them. And by the way, so the indices, the indices are always indicating where I should look for this space because look, uh, I, I just want to get back for a second. So when I'm thinking about this space, it should contain in the leftmost guy that I can meet here, right? If I go along these arrows and it should contain in the left rightmost guy that I meet here, right? And intersection of these two orange dots is just one dimension higher than this space. Actually the intersection of these two guys is always the span of the basis vectors uh, where the leftmost is uh, the first number in the index here and the uh, uh, rightmost is the second number, right? So it's a kind of a range of vectors where we should look for one dimensional subspace. Well, uh, yeah, sorry, not one, co-dimension one uh, subspace uh, to choose this V to four, right, for instance. So uh, so th that's what, what I have written here, right? So we always know where we could, where we should look for co-dimension one subspaces. And of course, in general situation, in general situation, as I already said, if these two guys are in general position, I have no choice for this guy, right? No choice, no choice in general. But sometimes we do have a choice. So uh, yeah, so, so, so yeah. Well, maybe that's, that's what, what I want to stress once again. So if I put all these guys below in general position, it's the open path. It's a kind of analog, analog of uh, open M1 plus 0, 1 plus N. But now I want to discuss what is going to be analog, non-commutative analog of these divisors. So first of all, since we are now in a sort of non-commutative setup, at least we expect non-commutative setup, when I use my indices I, it can be just every two subsets of the index set 1N, right? It should always be a sort of integral in interval, right? So I, I can fix the minimal guy here, I can fix the maximal guy in my interval, but then it should include all the points between these two guys, right? So I should really be a sort of uh, integer interval. And so then let's do the following. So I want to define these divisors, these divisors, and I do the following. I look at the guy, so V L minus one L, L is the minimum in, uh, in my index set I, and I want to set it to the rightmost possible uh, 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 vector space that it could be. So it's a subset of E L minus one E L, and I want to set it to E L. Yeah, question? No. Okay. And then for the for the for for this guy for V R R plus one, I want to set it to be equal to E R. So now let's study what is going to happen because that's that's quite nice. Let's look at this picture and let's try to understand. So you see, so this is, this is the guy that I said. So this, this, this is my choice for V L minus one L. So this is my choice for V R, R plus one, right? Now look, so since this guy, uh, so imagine, imagine that these guys are in general position, right? So if, uh, well, it, it, yeah, so, uh, if they are not, then I have uh, to discuss separately, but now I want to discuss uh, the open part of my device. So imagine that they're in general position. It means that everything here, what is all these black points that I have here, so all these black points, are then determined uniquely, are determined uniquely, and these black points are exactly what you should expect when you just look at the small piece that forms an individual brick open part of a brick manifold. Namely here I must have, here as a space I must have EL, EL plus one, 
here I must have EL, EL plus one, EL plus two, and so on. So this part, this part is a sort of fixed and isolated from the rest, fixed and isolated from the rest. Right, so if, if of course these, these blue choices are in general position, otherwise I still have to discuss a little bit. Right, then look, so what happens here? What happens in this side? So this blue part is still, I mean, behaves as a normal, as a normal, as a normal uh, part of a, of a, well, brick construction, I would say. But then I always have to add this EL and this EL is always necessarily transversal to all the guys that happen in this blue, in this blue area, right? So it means that when I think about these black points, these black points, I just add an extra basis vector, an extra direct summand to these spaces. So at this, at this level, I add, add to all the spaces on the previous level as a direct summand EL. At this level, I add as a direct summand EL, EL, minus, EL plus one, I'm sorry, and so on. So it, uh, the point is that so while here, here in this part, I did have some choices that I will normally have for the bricks. So this part, this orange part that I now want to highlight actually brings nothing new. It's just, I mean, I can even just, uh, I, I can take uh, these spaces that I have to add there as direct summands and uh, factor modulus spaces, right? Take a factor modulus spaces, take a quotient. So the same is on the right hand side. The same is on the right hand side. Namely, so this blue parallelogram is the last moment when I can choose something. And then this black, uh, these things that uh, happen here, actually up to this, up to this level, I'm sorry, up to this level. They just, I just have to add as a direct summons fixed vector spaces that are fixed actually by these points that were black in the beginning of my explanation, now orange, right? Okay, so what I can choose. So now you see, so I can choose, I mean, the things that I hear, Sir, right? I, I apologize. C can you do a small example? I kind of get lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to actually, so I'm going, first of all, uh, to show you once again, I mean, in a bit different picture. So what happens and then, and then we can do a small example. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but I just want to stress that somehow, uh, somehow, so all my choices are in this triangle, in this triangle, so here I just have a kind of isolated brick manifold of smaller dimension. And then if I would take this upper part and uh, take a quotient model of the space that stays here, it would be exactly what I have to add to these two triangles to get a brick another brick manifold that is a sort of for another component somehow of these uh, 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 two component curves that I don't have here in this, in this setup, but sort of want to think about since I mimic what happens in the modulus space of curves. Okay, okay so, uh, so Misha asked for a small example, but I still want, I still want to, to uh, show you once again my explanation, but now, so I made this picture, a colored picture, right? So I, what, what I did is that here and here, I fixed something to distinguish my divisor. Uh, then I'm, I'm saying, saying that this blue area, this blue area mm -hmm. forms me a smaller, a smaller, Mm, uh, brick manifold. Then these orange parts, these orange parts are uh, absolutely fixed. I can't do anything with them. And then the red parts that you see here, if I would merge them all together and from this upper red part factor out the very standard thing that I have there as a direct summon for all the spaces that are there. So then I get then I get uh, the, uh, uh, another brick manifold, right? So I want to stress so that this guy, uh, uh, so that, that when I think about this divisor, I get a product, well, open part of this divisor if you want, I get a, well, actually close part as well. I get, uh, I get a direct product of two brick manifolds of small dimension, which is exactly what we have seen in the model space of curve. So maybe I have to say that this one is the one that we see in red. So this is the red one, and this is the blue one. So small example. So Misha asked for a small example. I think it's good if I would indeed make a small example. So let's, uh, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> well, at the very, very end of the talk, so I made a sort of nice picture, but, but let me just make a very small example. So for instance, so what is, I mean, I can think about this graph. It should be just a point, right? Because it's a binary tree. So one, two, three, oh, sorry. One, two, three, right? What should I draw as a brick manifold? 
no, first of all, I mean, I have to start with the uh, three bricks, right? I have put two bricks above. So here I must have E1, here E1, E2, here again E1, E2, here E2, but what I should have here? So you see, I want somehow this point two to run away together with the point one. Just means that I want to put here E1, right? If I would change my picture, if I would change my picture and uh, sort of let me, let me uh, change the picture. So, 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 uh, and I want for instance now to have uh, another case, another possible graph, but there are only two graphs because now I have to consider planar trees. I always consider now only planar trees and all the leaves of this planet is are labeled from left to right by one end. So I even can skip the labeling because it's always standard. Then I have to put here E2, right? So then, then this blue area would be these two guys. And uh, so this is going to be blue area over there. And the red area, the red area is going to be actually, so these two guys, and uh, so I can quotient these two guys model E2, right? So that's basically basically an example for, for uh, wow, you, what happens there. You took my small example too literally, but <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, guys, so, okay. So uh, uh, to be honest, what I can what I can what I can propose, I mean, I no, no, that's fine. <laughs> I, I, I have a small warning. I have a small warning that it's not the end of the talk, and you will understand why. Because for the very end of the talk, I mean, when I'll speak about many other interesting things, I prepared another example. But I took a binary tree, but I made a drone it, uh, sort of uh, beautifully. <laughs> so, and I filled in everything that corresponds to this. Uh, to, you see, it should be just a point, right? Because it's a binary tree. So it should be just a point in B5. And I worked out here what should be the B5, right? So you see two and three, they're on the same company. It means that I have to put them in the extreme position, right? Yeah, yeah but uh, in this example, can you explain why this green pink on the second level is E1 or 2? E1 and 2. Yes, of course. Because you see, so first I can just put uh, the things like that. I can just put E1 and 2, right? And then I can have here everything, right? I can have in principle, so I can erase this guy here. Right, and just thinking because I have now this E1 and 2, 1, 2, right? Oh, sorry, 2, 3, sorry, 2, 3, right? But in general, in general position, I would have here uh, no further, no further de degenerations. I would just have here, uh, sorry, I let me try to rush and that's not good. So I have here just 1, 4, 5, right? So yeah. but what does it mean for me in practice? In practice, it means that I have to look at what happens here and just mod out E2 from all of them, right? Above E2, I just want to mod out E2, right? So yeah. as I said, so, and then, then I think about uh, dimension one less, right? And yeah. uh, so I just keep the index two in my index set. Yeah, okay. Okay, but then, then I have to put here something, right? And when I put, uh, so one, it means that one and the node of this guy then run away on a separate component. It means that I want to put what, what I can put here in the extreme left position. Means I can choose here between E1, uh, it's a one dimensional subspace of E1 and 3. So I have to choose here E1, right? If I now remember that I had to mod out the 2, so I will put it 2, right? So that's how I get from this general picture to this degeneration where 1 is on a separate, on a separate uh, uh, component somehow at a separate vertex, right? I mean, so, so these guys, it would require further explanation because that's what happens here. I mean, it's somehow isolated from that. I maybe made too complicated example now, right? No, no, okay. so, so each time, th that's the point, that each time when I put one of, these, uh, one of these vector spaces in some extreme position, some degeneration happens in my tree that uh, corresponds to the sort of topological type, so to say, of this brick construction. Uh, yeah. No, no, it was a question. So why is E5 missing in the picture? But uh, what is P missing? E5, but uh, it should not be E5 here, right? It should not be E5. I always have uh, uh, what what concerns the number of vectors. I always have basis vectors one less than sort of the number of points, marked points. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, so that's, uh, I don't know, I mean, it's uh, uh, something we have to digest, it's something we have to digest. Uh, uh, 
so I get back to this and the point is that now indeed I mean so I explained here what is the divisor and to be honest I mean I, I think that this explanation should be understandable I hope right so this green thing is the the, the only thing that I can choose uh, above this level in general position right so uh, but it was green so maybe I want to get it green back no it's more like green but uh, kind of yeah it's uh, uh, I'm missing a homework exercise Yes, yeah, but uh, well, uh, home exercise is, uh, I don't know, I mean, to draw any tree for four guys, well, preferably this one, so home exercise, indeed. So, uh, think about this guy, so one, two, well, it's about this guy and about this guy, two, three, uh, so one, four, both are co-dimension one, so they should be just one degeneration, and so draw a general brick construction that corresponds to these types, mm -hmm. right? But in general, as I said, so we have to think. Uh, we have to think always like that. That we have, uh, we have. So this uh, this part, which is a smaller, smaller brick manifold that corresponds to this sphere that runs away from well uh, from the uh, root, and then from these red parts, well, uh, when we mod out some something standard that must be in the top part, so we get another 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 brick. So this one. Okay, so uh, the point is uh, the point is that after I understood this, after I understood that each time I consider this NC divisor, so I get the product of two brick manifolds of small dimension. I can iterate this, and then so what what I finally get is what is in here, namely that I consider all possible planet trees. Uh, well, where well at least uh, each vertex is at least a binary vertex means has at least two guys above it attached to it, and the leaves are labeled. By, by the labels 1n from left to right in a standard way because this is the non-commutativity which is uh, built into the construction, right? Excuse me, C could you just uh, uh, comment? You, you have a correspondence, so for every tree, on one hand you have a divisor, well, you have a, uh, well, something, some co-dimension, uh, something manifold in your model space, on the other hand you have brick manifold. So do you claim that the is isomorphic or or what? I know it's, I'm talking about stratification of brick manifolds, right? I'm talking about stratification. What I'm claiming it, is so that strata every of brick manifolds are in bijection with strata of model spaces, or uh, that I didn't say because this is uh, you see uh, model spaces that I had before. The trees there were not planar. You see now I have planar trees, and now these planar trees are labeled in a standard way from left to right. So it's a kind of non-commutative version of. Uh, uh, of stratification that we had in the model space of curves. So you have uh, stratification of model space of something which is similar to model space of curves, but not exactly. Not uh, exactly. And uh, there is some non-commutativity that we already see here, right? So that we have planet mm -hmm. trees instead of arbitrary trees, and that the labels are actually arranged from left to right. Yeah. Well, okay. well, the, the difference is that before we can uh, label uh, components in different ways, so kind of. We, we have like extra permutation built. Well, uh, maybe maybe yeah. maybe it would be good if I would if I would give a small example here because you see I mean I already did this example uh, with uh, B three right and there are only two strata there are only two strata that I ha can have one is well it's co-dimension one means it's just points in this case because it's a one-dimensional variety and these two strata are these two guys right so uh, given by these two guys right by these two trees. In the case of M01 uh, plus three, we had three different strata, right? Remember, I mean, it was before, we had three different special points. So uh, I go back and I show you this picture. So we had these three special points, right? Because these are non-planar graphs and I can distribute my labels arbitrarily, right? So both M04 and B3 are CP1s, but the number of special points that are part of the stratification is different. And the difference is exactly by requiring that trees are no longer EBITDA trees, but planar trees, and the labels are arranged from left to right in a standard way. Hmm? Is it okay? Yes, yes, it's uh, more or less clear. Yeah, yeah you, you, can, you cannot have like one and three together and two outside. Yes, yes, yeah. They always, uh, there is this, uh, yeah, non commutative that is going to play some role. Uh, okay, so now some facts, some facts. So again, I, if I just consider a graph, but now it should be a planar graph with all the, uh, uh, well, 
with all the um, um, leaves labeled from one to n from left to right. So this is this open part of the modulus phase of curves and its compactification, oh, sorry, of brick manifold and its compactification is the full brick manifold, right? So my divisors, so I take graphs with one edge and so this, uh, the, the closure, I mean, the closure is given by, by all the trees that can be, uh, can be uh, obtained by expansion of this particular small tree with one edge. So this gives me the divisors inside the space. And of course, any further graph, any further graph, any further stratum is obtained as a transverse on the section of a few divisors, as before. The description of the cohomology. It's literally this theorem of, uh, so it's theorem that I can call NCQ, NCQ theorem. So namely, I take the uh, uh, free algebra generated by NC divisors, and then, okay, look, I must have a linear relation for the divisors. But now when I choose three points, due to this uh, uh, non-commutativity, which is intrinsic to the space, these three points must be chosen in a row. So it's I minus one, I and I plus one, right? And then I say that two of them, and of course, I mean, these two should be neighbors to each other, are in I and another one is not in I. And uh, so this is instead of saying that two arbitrary points are in I and the third uh, point is not in I. And so here I do the other thing that I can do, namely say that I and I plus one are in this I capital and I minus one is not in I capital. So it's a direct uh, sort of non-commutative analog of the linear relation that, uh, that Kiel had in uh, the case of the usual model space of course. The other relation is exactly the same. If two guys, two non-commutative divisors don't intersect with each other, then uh, their product must be zero in cohomology. That is, so that's, that's a sort of uh, first thing to digest, that uh, we have a space whose stratification is very similar to the stratification of the model space of curves. The description of cohomology is also very similar. And uh, so the only thing that happens is that if we try to impose uh, non-commutative assumption on graphs, it's what we naturally get, right? But it's only beginning. So what's about psi classes? So about psi classes, we had to think a little bit because that's, uh, uh, I mean, uh, there's no natural geometric model except for these brick manifolds, I mean, that we can use here. And so you see, so what I want to have here is the following. So first of all, I define uh, what is the psi class at the output, at the root. And I take the following. So you see, I mean, the last vector space that I can choose, well, maybe sometimes not choose because it's determined by the rest, but that can vary, is this one, right? And so these two guys, these two dots are absolutely standard spaces, are these spaces that I have here. So as a cotangent line, analog of the cotangent line uh, bundle at the output, at the zero point, I take this, uh, uh, this uh, 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 factor, right? So I take this space that I have at the top mod the next to the top one. And I call it L0. So when I vary this configuration of bricks, uh, this varies as a uh, fiber of a line bundle, which I call it L0. So for the uh, 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 analogs of cotangent lines at the input, I just look, look, I, I have here the spaces, V1, 2, V2, 3, and so on. And okay, so these standard spaces that I have and the leftmost and the, and the rightmost corner, I also introduce this name V01, which is standardly E1, and Vn minus 1n, which is standardly En minus 1. And so what I want to call the cotangent lines at this sort of input points from one to n is just the dual spaces to these guys. Just the dual spaces to these guys, right? So they vary also as fibers of a line bundle over Bn. And so psi classes are just the first chain classes of these line bundles. Important remark, of course, uh, the, the leftmost and the rightmost guys are standard, so they don't vary. So psi one and psi n must be equal to zero. I can't do anything about that. But what are the nice properties of the psi classes? No, again, so first of all, I mean, I had these expressions in terms of the divisors that I, by the way, call topological recursion relations. And uh, the expressions are exactly the same mod the fact that I have to, uh, to deal with a non-commutative situation. Namely, when I want to express psi zero, I can choose two points, but this should be two points next to each other, right? So I have these expressions for psi zero. And for the sum, remember, I had to take the sum of the devices where this index is in the set i. It's exactly the same formula as I had before. 
So self-intersection of the divisor. Again, it's going to be exactly the same formula as I had before. So this, this green one. So I just have to say what are, so psi accent and psi to accent. But remember, remember, so when I was talking about uh, these uh, two, uh, uh, this product of two brick manifolds, right? So somehow I had this green point, green point, uh, let me get back to the picture uh, uh, that I highlighted as green, which is a kind of uh, the, for, 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 for the, um, uh, this smaller brick manifold at the output, uh, played the role of the node, right? So let me go back, let me go back to this picture. And this green point is a sort of playing uh, uh, for me, the role of marked point that actually captures the node, right? So I want to take Psi class at this marked point, at this green. And then here, I mean, there's a standard brick manifold. I just take Psi to accent at the output. It's Psi zero on this particular space, right? So it's exactly what I should call Psi classes at the node on both branches in the commutative case, right? And uh, the formula for the self-intersection of the device is exactly the same. Okay, so uh, I would say that uh, this is only something that indicates that we are working with a very good space that mimics the intersection theory of the modular space of curves uh, very closely, but with these uh, extra non-commutative uh, non things that we meet here and there. And I want to go a bit further because uh, how people are using, why people like so much this modular space of curves or genus zero. It's because people often consider what is called hypercommutative algebras, but sometimes people call it also, I don't know, Frobenius manifolds, ground fitting invariants, uh, what else, uh, quantum, uh, quantum uh, product. Uh, I don't know what are the other names for the same. Uh, yeah, so there are, there are many names for the same object in the literature. And basically the story is about the following. So uh, I mean, uh, I now switch into a kind of new topic. So if you have questions about what I just said, so that's, that's a good moment to ask questions, but, uh, but otherwise I'll just show you one more parallel between these two guys. Question, can you repeat the definition of Li? Li, what is Li? Li is a topological line bundle. Uh-huh, yes, I can. So uh, yeah, so let's look. You see, I have this configuration of bricks, right? Yes. And so here at the, at the source, like at the lowest level, I have one dimensional spaces. Yes. So what I want to call by LIs here is just duals to these one dimensional spaces. So this guy is a kind of analog. This guy is an analog, is analog of, uh, so the cotangent line at the i mark point in commutative, in commutative uh, situation. Uh, no, I... I mean, so, well, I mean, I have a vector space. It's just a one dimensional vector space. And when I change the configuration of bricks, right? This space varies as a fiber of a line bundle. Um, so this, this I probably should erase because it might be misleading. It's just analog of that in the commutative situation. No, no, okay. Uh, no, I understand. Um, uh, I. I just don't understand this. Well, what I cannot point. My, what what about this factor? So this factor is the following. You see, when I'm thinking about the output at the at the point zero, right? The point zero here is very special. I don't have nice one-dimensional space for the point zero, but it should play a role somewhere at the output, right? Somewhere here. Yeah. And so, I mean, I have no explanation why this is a natural definition, except for that it works very nicely for this normal ah, okay. bundle so, for a divisor. Oh, I, but I what, so this definition is like L0 not, L0. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's L0. So this is, this is, this is the definition for L0. Yeah, yeah. And this is the definition for, for uh, Li, for all other i's. So L0 is special. Yeah, okay, I understand. It's special, and that's by the way a problem that I don't see here a natural output, right? So here I, here I see inputs, but I don't see. Continue. So what is hypercommutative algebra? 
that basically what people consider in this session is the space of a modulus on m01 plus n now that's why i have to distinguish one n because n guys uh, uh play the role of inputs and one guy is playing the role of the output this root right so i wanted to is sn invariant so when i simultaneously interchange the labels of these points and uh the components of my tensor product it should remain invariant it should be sn invariant with the simultaneous diagonal sn action and then when i restrict my uh, uh class to the divisor as i remind you is a product of two smaller modular spaces it should be and then i didn't know how to denote the operation but what i want to do here is i want to take the product of the cohomology classes on these spaces right this external product right and then i will simultaneously compose them as homomorphisms right i want to do this simultaneously and so this is the symbol that i invented for that i don't know whether it's a good symbol maybe it's a bad one so that's basically what i want to consider that's basically what people are always doing uh, when they think about this space they always consider this uh, set of factorizable forms and the easiest source of this uh, factorizable forms is ground fit and theory but let's just say that we want to study them by by itself so just uh, without any motivation so far so what i can do when i have this differential uh, well, uh, classes alpha n i can integrate them over m0 one plus n bar and then I just get an, uh, some system of operations on, uh, from V tends N to V, right? So it defines me some algebraic structure on the space V, where I have this, uh, so uh, binary, trinary, uh, and then I don't know what is the proper word, uh, quaternary, or I don't know, <laughs> operations that are subject to some conditions and these conditions uh, we can read from the from the relations for the divisors right so this is the famous wdv relation so it's called wdv relation uh, and uh, 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 so which comes from the linear relation for the divisors in the cohomology of the modulus space of curves right so this kind of structure that we can get from any system of factorizable classes on the modulus space of curves is called hypercommutative algebra in some other literature is also called flat flat f manifold and it's a very close notion to uh Fabianus manifold right so so what is important what is important to know about this uh, these guys right because i'm going to discuss them in some way to to show you another parallel between the two spaces right and the most uh uh, uh ubiquitous thing about these guys is the so-called given type group action so given type group action, so I'm going to describe it very explicitly in a second, but that's a kind of way. So when I get one system of these factorizable classes and an arbitrary, arbitrary, uh, um, well, uh, uh, matrix uh, uh, that depends on Z and whose leading term is identity in homomorphism from V to V, right? Arbitrary operator R like that, I can construct a new one. And that's a group action. So that's an action of this, uh, uh, so group of uh, like, I don't know, uh group like elements in this loop group of uh v right so that's an action of this group on this alpha tildes and this action is i mean it has a dense orbit and so on it's a very nice action and uh, it's kind of related to the fact that even if you don't see any sister action on a target variety in ground fitting theory it's uh somehow should be there or in different words so we can also say that what should be behind any non fitting type theory or any Fabianus manifold is some matrix model and uh like like the tool for the for the target varieties would be localization the tool for the matrix models would be this topological recursion of chekhov in rn rn10 right so that's something that is in behind of all these all these factorizable classes like here right and the point is that then i can give an explicit formula how to act by an element of this group by an element of this group on a class so i get a new system of classes and this system of classes looks like that. I have to consider the sum of all dual graphs, and I want to decorate these uh, graphs with psi classes and then push forward uh, to the corresponding stratum in the model space of curves. How I decorate is explicitly described here. I put at each input, so I mean just my matrix, but now as a formal variable of this matrix, I use psi class at this at this marked point. At each vertex. I remind you that vertices in dual graphs correspond to the irreducible components. I put my original class alpha. At the output, I also put some, uh, well, this group element, but now, but now, now of, uh, well, with a, with a change of sign, which doesn't matter for me at the moment. 
but it's also just I apply some extra operators and multiply by psi classes the the uh, the class that I will put here, the alpha class that I put here, and on the edges again I put some explicit explicit expression in psi classes and matrices R. So I get a graph decorated by psi classes and my old classes alpha, and I push forward this graph uh, to my modular space of curves when I want to compute alpha and tilde. And this sum gives me a new cohomology class there inside with the values still in V tensor and in homomorphism from V tensor N to V. And that's exactly what I want to call alpha N tilde, right? As I said, so I'm not going to motivate further this procedure now. It's, well, I think it's uh, fantastic enough that we have this group action because if you think formally about deformation theory of this algebraic structure, it's very difficult to see that uh, this algebraic structure would have such a rich. Uh, uh, group of symmetries, right? So it's uh, from the point of view of formal algebraic structures, operats, deformation theory for operats, it's a miracle. But in any case, as I said, so this miracle has some explanations in these theories, either in, uh, in uh, localization theory or in Chekhov and Arendt theory. So that's basically what motivated giving type to formulate it in, well, roughly this way. In any case, so let me get now to this, uh, uh, because I want to show you as an extra thing, and I, I, I'm not sure that Misha, how much time would I have? Because I'm going to show you at least, I mean, the same effect in uh, these brick manifolds, but then the question is how much time I have to proceed. So when do you want to stop? Uh, you are not, uh, I mean, you, you switched off your mic. Um, uh, 15 minutes is okay. Yeah, 15 minutes, okay, yes, yeah. I, I'll, skip, I'll skip some part of what I prepared. So uh, I see that I prepared too much, it's okay. Okay, so now I want to introduce uh, something that we call non-commutative hypercommutative algebra. So again, so what I'm doing, I'm considering cohomology classes on these brick manifolds. So with the values in uh, V tensor and uh, in homomorphism from V tensor N to V. So now, since it's uh, non-commutative, I expect no symmetry at all with respect to permutations of, this, uh, of these labels. But what I still want to have, I want when I restrict my alpha N to a divisor, and divisor, I remind you, is the product of two brick manifolds. I still want to have the same effect as before. So that uh, I have a product of cohomology classes and simultaneously composition of homomorphisms of uh, tensor products of vector spaces. Okay? Yeah. So that's, that's a very natural definition. So nice that I can do this. Uh, so I can integrate my classes and get a system of operations. And so this system of operations, okay, so I have written here even explicitly the relation that we would have. And uh, so this relation is of course coming from the relation for, uh, for the divisor that we had in the description of the cohomology, right? So it's uh, what is for me natural to call, I mean, the, uh, this system of operations, MN, subject to these relations, what is natural for me to call NC hypercom or, I mean, NC, F manifold, flat F manifold, and C flat F manifold, or I mean any other NC for the same name that people use in the commutative situation. And then remarkable thing, remarkable thing. If I would produce exactly the same formulas as before, as in the commutative case, but I would restrict, I mean, you see, I still have my alpha, these classes. I still have my R. R is exactly the same as it was before in the commutative case. What I changed is the system of graphs that I can have. Now I have only planar graphs with leaves labeled from left to right in the standard way. But I decorate these planar graphs in exactly the same way as before. In exactly the same way as before. So then what I want to say is that I obtain in this situation also this given type theory, right? A nice group action on uh, on uh, the space of, uh, well, uh, what, what I would maybe should call, I mean, and seek homological field theories on the space of this classes alpha subject to uh, factorization condition. Good. So uh, I have 10 minutes, so I have to think a little bit about what I want to say further because, uh, so you see, I mean, may maybe I have I want to reflect here a little bit about this given type group action because, uh, so at some point, uh, you see, when you think purely in terms of, I mean, this algebraic structures that I'm discussing here now, I mean, thinking just about this representation of, uh, of homology, of homology, better to say, considered as an operat, uh, 
so I was thinking for a long time, so whether I can obtain another opera that would, be, would have as rich system of these uh, uh, symmetries as uh, these hypercommutative algebras, right? And so when I uh, uh, thought about that, so it looked like the number of conditions uh, is so huge that it limits us to just one case when we would have such a wonderful deformation theory uh, that we get from the given type group. And so for me, it was a miracle that there is a, I mean, you see, even, even if I would not, uh, even if I wouldn't use all this terminology that suggests that we are working with the uh, non-symmetric, uh, non-commutative versions of the same objects, it's, for me, it's kind of miracle that we managed to find an example where the same rich group of symmetries works, right? So that's a remarkable thing. It has many connections. I have no time, uh, no time to speak about the connections of a uh, given type group to different other areas of mathematics. But one thing I still want to mention, and uh, let, me, let me maybe very, very briefly, because, uh, yeah, I don't know, link is, I prepared this, so why not to talk about that? Uh, so let me think. No, no, I think, I think maybe, maybe, maybe I'll go through all the slides without mentioning anything, and we'll stop here, because th that would take more than uh, five minutes that I still left. So now the point is the following. So you see, so I, I skipped here some huge part, but the point is that, well, maybe the point was that, in, well, I'll explain it in this slide. So I'll skip some part of what I prepared. But what I want to say is the following, that you see, uh, so these hypercommutative algebras, as I said, so they emerge in many different ways, in many different ways. So uh, they come from Gromfitton theory, for instance. They come from singularity theory. So when you think about uh, integrable Hamiltonian systems, they also produce you these hypercommutative algebras. So when you think about BCUV theory, so roughly speaking, these polyvector fields on Calabi are manifolds. So there was this step that I, well, I put on the previous slides, but I don't want to explain now. So you can go through BV algebras and uh, still construct this hypercommutative thing. And uh, yeah, so I put here one more thing is that these semi-Hamiltonian systems, they also produce these hypercommutative algebras. It's of course, I mean, somehow just a bit more general thing than Hamiltonian integral systems. But I put it here explicitly because this is the only source I know that essentially breaks, breaks the symmetry between, input and, uh, between inputs and output in hypercommutative algebras, right? So in any case, so the point is the following. So we have so many wonderful sources for these hypercommutative algebras. And so the question is, what can be natural sources for uh, the non-commutative analogs that I just introduced? Because you see, we developed a very rich theory. I mean, every other property that you know about hypercommutative algebras and algebraic structures related to them and so on, it can be reflected in, uh, in this non-commutative world. For instance, I mean, uh, there is this connection between hypercommutative algebras and Batalin-Vilkovsky algebras and non-commutative Batalin-Vilkovsky algebras that they were, I mean, defined in the literature for completely different reasons than what we are talking here. And still they have appeared to be related to our structure. And there are many other, there are many other phenomena related to the, that can be reflected in this non-commutative world very explicitly. But what I miss, what I miss, and so we developed all the theory. So there is a sort of, I mean, 70 pages of parallels between uh, the usual model space of curves and brick manifolds, but what we don't have, we don't have any natural source of examples. And so maybe the main thing for me, I mean, is to have this opportunity to ask you guys, so whether you have ever seen, whether you have any seen any natural operations in any other branch of mathematics that could be defined using these brick configurations. Right, so that's, I, I mean, I want to be able to produce the cohomology classes on the brick manifolds in a natural way. And so, so let me leave this question to you. So, because if you have any ideas, they would be very welcome. Because once we would know where these brick manifold can, manifolds can act in the same way as this hypercommutative algebras control, for instance, quantum multiplication in gromfield theory. So we would immediately have a very rich theory of connections with all kinds of branches of mathematics that we managed to find to, uh, for this analogy between, uh, uh, so the usual model space of curves and non-commutative model space of curves. Okay, so let me stop here. So now we get to this picture that by Misha's request I have shown too early in this talk. But yeah, let me really stop here. Okay, um, thanks, Aurora. <laughs> um, well, time for questions, so please ask questions. Um, 
you by the way can turn on your videos because I see all of you on a separate screen, and uh, so uh, all of you just means two two <laughs> two people in addition to me. <laughs> yes. Okay. May I have some short questions, Serosha? Yes, sure. Uh, when you consider these certifications, so you have uh, originally you have this uh, selected leg that you label uh, zero. But yes. In each stratum, do you have also selected legs? Or, uh, yes, of course, of course, it's a kind of this output, right? So you see, so this is this is uh, well in this picture, even in this picture. Look, I mean, so this corresponds to some. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I mean, I want to say not in each stratum, but on each component, I have a selected output, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a sort of outgoing, outgoing edge uh, from this company and gives me this uh, selected output, right? And so this is the global one for the whole graph. This is the root. It just to mention that in this situation, for instance, if you come back to topological recursion, actually it's uh, hugely, hugely enlarge the possible systems that can be served. Because well, yes, yeah, because, but... Uh, because uh, there we don't have this concevich soibelman uh, restrictions, nothing. So it can be basically, so it's, we can uh, choose some parameters at will. Well, yeah, so I mean, uh, you see, so that's, that's basically a bit of a problem for me that most of the sources of natural examples for uh, in the in the commutative situation, for instance, I can indeed just try to apply your topological recursion, right? So, uh, though it's not obvious, topological recursion produces me something entirely symmetric. So I can interchange uh, one, uh, one uh, input and output, right? And it still would be symmetric. So, and here, you see, I don't have any sort of cyclic uh, structure at all, because remember, even these two inputs, one, number one and number n, were so distinguished that psi classes at these two inputs were equal to zero, right? So there's no chance for any cyclic structure at all. And it looks like it really enlarges the number of examples. But the problem is that I looked at all possible sources of examples for hypercommutative algebras trying to get, because so what can, be, what can be adapted to my construction? Those constructions that give me uh, essentially non-cyclic uh, hypercommutative algebras. Non-cyclic, I mean that the input and output are essentially different. The only source is, uh, so that I have found so far, is this uh, semi-Hamiltonian systems of Tsarev. So each time I see some expert in integral systems, I run after him or her asking, so can you please tell me, I mean, how to get the semi-Hamiltonian systems in some natural way and preferably with a non-commutative generalization. But it has appeared also, well, to be a bit delicate question. So there are, it's not so easy to construct natural uh, semi-Hamiltonian systems. Uh, even in uh, most of them constructed from Hamiltonian systems after all. Because all on that logical regression by Gaetan. Well, uh, first of all, not only not by Gaetan. Not only by Gaetan, <laughs> okay, but just. <laughs> no, just because it's my yeah, joint but, paper with Gaetan. But, but, so but, It's not, the same, it's not the same, so there is also everything is pretty cyclic. So it's really difficult to get out of uh, so to prove it. It's but once you prove it, it you see that there is no way to construct an initial example without it. So that's uh, that's the main problem. Okay. Uh, but it's discussion. Sorry. Sorry, me. Um, um, more questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, so if you start with a tree as you do, but now you uh, assign a genus to each node of the tree, is there any way to modify the brick construction so you somehow reproduce the behavior of MGN for higher G? Well, uh, no, uh, yeah, we don't know, we don't know. We don't know because, again, I mean, so the best of what can be done is to have this kind of uh, uh, properadic type thing, namely, uh, namely, uh, 
to, to create a genus, but still to have no uh, inner product on the target vector space. Uh, but the point is that uh, you see, we are even not able to construct uh, the thing in genus zero that would have not one output, but two outputs, right? So mm -hmm. it's uh, not clear how to do this in this brick manifolds construction. So that, that's a completely open uh, question for me. So it's, well, it would be very nice to do any step in this direction. But uh, yeah, I don't know. So uh, for me, the main motivation so far is to, to look for examples for what is already done rather than to make further steps in algebraic constructions. But yeah, so that would be very interesting, but I don't know what to do. Okay. Okay. Um, other questions? Uh, maybe, may I ask a linguistic question? So what is non-commutative here? When you say non-commutative, it means that non-equivalence between source and things? Like no, when I say non-commutative, I mean that these guys, I mean the inputs, they are arranged from left to right with no change to, uh, with no interchange between them. So no symmetry between them. Okay, non-commutative, it means that uh, you don't have fast uh, permutation group action. Okay. Yes, yeah, okay. exactly. So uh, when I speak that uh, the output is distinguished from the inputs is uh, non-cyclicity. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So if you speak about <laughs> oh, so, standard so, terminology. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> But how it affects psi classes, non-commutativity? Well, a psi classes is an indication that we have a very, very deep non-commutativity hidden there. Because remember, one of the remarks was that psi classes are in general non-trivial, but psi classes, uh, psi classes, uh, uh, psi one and psi n are equal to zero. It's just an indication that this construction, I mean, uh, I mean can, uh, be made can be made. made as, I hear myself, I hear back. myself back. It can be made cyclic or whatsoever, right? And so this kind of non-commutativity is also, well, but it's so intrinsic to this construction that I even don't know how to say further why it's so much non-commutative as we see it. Okay. Yeah. Um, more questions? Excuse me, it's a brick manifold. It's uh, just, there is no geometric interpretation of what, what it looks like, uh, except for just, I don't know. For example, well, it comes to my mind that you, sometimes you have, for example, you have a configuration of points on RP1, not CP1, and it's also have some cyclic order, which is natural. Yeah, from. yeah, but, but you see, so the configuration of points on uh, RP1 there, well, what, what you get by that is uh, like a sahedra itself. Right, and and uh, so so that's quite different, right? So uh, no, I mean I don't have any geometric interpretation. I have many geometric interpretations, but not of the sort of uh, moduli type, not parameterizing some uh, uh, the moduli of some objects, except for these brick manifolds, right? So I have interpretation as as I already said, it's a toric variety of uh, Lade realization of a sahedra. Another realization, so for a special uh, uh, hyperplane arrangements, you can consider this uh, wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful, I have forgotten the word, wonderful model of the Cancini Procesi, right? So I can also give you a sequence of blow ups how to construct it from, uh, uh, well, it's a toric variety, so I can start with a, a standard computation, uh, just with the product of CP once and apply a sequence of uh, blow ups to construct, right? There are many ways how to do it geometrically to describe these manifolds, but there is no description as uh, moduli parameterizing something. But there is a the pro projection of this, uh, this space to the space of configuration on just, just points on CP1 or not? Uh, no, I think it is. Well, it's, uh, no, there is a projection. Well, uh, there is a projection. So you see each of these VIs, right? Each of these VIs, is in its own CP1, right? So I can take just, I mean, I can say that this guy varies in its own CP1. I can take this guy. And so, okay, mm -hmm. so then the point is that when they're in the extreme positions, I have to blow up, right? So each CP1 has two special points, right? Zero and infinity. And when uh, one of these guys in the extreme position, I have to blow up this product of CP1s. Mm -hmm, so of course, I mean, there is a projection back to the product of these CP1s, mm -hmm. but it doesn't uh, actually help. Mm -hmm. Well, it helps maybe to compute everything or to prove this uh, this theorem about cohomology, but it doesn't help to to construct any other object that this model space could parameterize. Mm -hmm. For which this space would be a model space, more precisely. Yeah. 
I see. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, but you see, so this is the most dramatic description that I have, and I, I really hope that at one moment when I'm speaking about it, somebody would actually say, but you know, with this configuration, you can construct some operation in my favorite branch of mathematics. So that would be the best. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, more questions? Well, it seems that we run out of questions. So, Sergey, thanks again. So, uh, yeah, and uh, so we stop for today. And uh, could, could you please send me uh, kind of notes and everything? Yeah, I can send you this file, but it also contains. I, I mean, I also added there some part about BV algebras and their relation, and so and uh, CBV we, we can discuss it later. So. Yes. <laughs> No, I mean, I can say, but uh, my, my file is a bit more than I managed to tell, so, but. That's fine. I hope it's not a problem. No. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Yeah. See you next week. Bye. Bye.